<laughs> All right, here we go, guys. Uh, we are broadcasting live, so whatever you say from this point forward can be held against you in a uh, internet court. So let's roll this thing. Notice the silence. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Before I clicked record, everyone was all chatty, and now it's silence. I love that. All right, here we go. Let's roll this. So we're going to record TWIP episode 290, as yet untitled, uh, featuring Mr. Don Komarechka and Joseph Lenashki, two men with the easiest names on the planet. <laughs> to spell, write. yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness for lower thirds. Look at that. <laughs> all right, here we go, guys. <clears throat> and this is for the audio, for the win. And welcome back to TWIP. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Today on the show, we're going to be diving into Canon deciding to throw their hat into the brick and mortar uh, storefront arena. We're going to talk about Google's 16 most popular photographers in the world and kind of try to dissect how they got to that number. We're going to do a little social media update. And we have an interview with Zenfolio's director of marketing, Ian Stone. He's going to be talking about the recent acquisition of Zenfolio by Art.com. Joining me to discuss these topics and more are Mr. Don Komarechka and Joseph Lenashki. Hey, guys. Howdy, howdy. Hey, Frederick. Welcome back. Hey, Joseph, where, where have you been? I, I think the last time you were on TWIP, you were single. <laughs> right. I don't think that's quite true, is it? <laughs> you were single. There was no facial hair. You know what? Wow. What is going on? Come on, it's been, it hasn't been that long. I think it's been what that long. I, I don't know what I've been doing. I actually haven't been traveling much. So I've been sitting right here in my little office uh, up here in Oregon, uh, fighting the snow. It's domesticated. Actually, oh, uh, domesticated. That's right. You're a house um, cat now. <laughs> <laughs> meow. <laughs> Then. Yeah, it's, it just hasn't been a lot of travel lately. A uh, couple of big travel things fell through, unfortunately, so I've just been staying home and working here, working on Aperture Expert and working on local photography business. And how's that going? How's Aperture going? Expert going? Going like gangbusters. We're actually talking about doing a complete site redesign, just ground up. I've kind of hit the wall. You know, it's two years old now, and yeah. pretty much hit the wall with Squarespace and what I can do with that. I love those guys, love what it is, but, you know, there's, there's limits to it. Yeah. So I'm talking to a, uh, a Drupal engineer who's oh. looking at doing a full-on ground-up, massive everything, and hopefully get all the features in there that I've wanted, that I've always wanted, that I couldn't you do. Should, you should talk to Don McAllister over at Screencast Online. I think, he, I think his site is built on Drupal. So oh, yeah? Yeah, you might want to reach cool. out to him. I will. And subscribe to Screencast Online while you're at it. <laughs> Just to look at it. <laughs> And also, also over there with the uh, with the maple leaf flag on his lower third is Mr. Don Komarechka. Hey, Don, welcome back. Hello, Frederick. It's been so long. I know it's been what uh, seven days exactly, almost. Right? Well, it's six because remember on uh, Thursday of last week we did a little interview on macro photography. That's right. And, uh, and so you can find that on the uh, This Week in Photo website if anybody's curious uh, for that little thing. Yeah, that and, was good. Uh, by the way, thank you for doing that. Oh, no problem at all. Uh, tons of positive feedback on that. So thank you very much for uh, allowing me to do it. Yeah. And over the past week, I've just been editing snowflakes more and more and more every day, uh, continuing along with the Snowflake a Day project on Google+. So that's keeping me busy. That's cool. You're what do you, the what? snowflake guy. Cool. That's me. <laughs> You're the snowflake guy. <laughs> I guess that's what I'm known as. So, uh, and and it's it's been going really well. Uh, it continues to build up steam until the uh, project ends every year. So... Uh, today we just posted. I think the biggest snowflake I've ever photographed uh, went up today. So check the, back the to biggest? number biggest. The biggest. It measures nine millimeters in diameter. Wow! And uh, that's about as big as they come. And uh, that's uh, number forty-seven in the series. So you can check that out. That is so cool. It's like a, you know, each one you post. I mean, we've all heard the whole thing about no two snowflakes <laughs> are alike. But you know, each one you post is a work of art in and of itself. It's a, it's amazing. And quite drastically different from all others, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at some that might appear on the surface to be similar, you, you get into all the fine details and it's very organic. Like you wouldn't ever find two trees that look the same. Right. Uh, and the same is true of snowflakes. That's great. Well, keep yeah. it up. Keep it up. You're, you're entertaining me, so don't stop. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> that's what it's all about. Right? That's, that's why you do what you do, isn't it? Don't exactly. <laughs> Keep me entertained. Cool. All right, guys, let's jump into the news. There's a couple of interesting things to talk about today. The first thing is, um, you guys may remember uh, the, the retail chain Jessup's over in the UK went under, and Canon 
conversely, <laughs> decided that they're going to jump into the retail market, kind of doing following suit with what Apple did with the retail stores and Microsoft then did or Dell started. Remember? So Canon's doing it now. So Joseph, is this, do you, do we need a, a, like a retail store like this from a major camera manufacturer? Well, I don't know that it needs to come from a major camera manufacturer, but obviously that's the only way you can control the image, control mm -hmm. the message and control everything else. So that's sure. why Apple did what it did, right? You could yeah. buy Apple products in a million places, but actually talking to someone who knew what the heck they were talking about was a pretty hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, I get it, right? Because when you buy a camera, you really it's not the kind of thing that unless you know what you're buying, you don't want to just order it online sight unseen, especially if it's your first of a particular type. Uh, if you're trying to decide between, say, Canon and Nikon, you, you've got to get your hands on it. And a lot yeah. of people say... That's one of the reasons a lot of people go with Canon or Nikon because, you know, let's face it, feature for feature, they're basically the same thing. Um, but a lot of people just love the way the Canon feels and a lot of people love the way the Nikon feels. That's a big part of it. I actually had a, uh, a, somebody I know from Google+, Plus, actually, or actually I think through Aperture Expert, but also knows me on Google+, Plus, who lives in town here, and I had mentioned some cameras that I've got on loan, and he was saying, oh, I've been, I've been wanting to get my hands on those cameras, and there's no storage anywhere around here where he can get his hands on them. Hmm. You'd have to go all the way up to Portland to do it. So would I mind getting together with them and letting them, you know, play with the gear? Yeah. And it's just, it is important. People want to be able to get their hands on it. So but, I you know, it. I, I totally, I, I get that piece of it, but where it, where it gets me is, I guess, I guess it's the same with the Apple store and, and other manufacturer stores, but particularly with cameras, I want to look at the different camera bodies and say, okay, this is the, what are the virtues of the Canon, this particular Canon body over this Nikon body and that sure. kind of thing. And that will, of course, never happen, you know, in the well, right. Canon store. Yeah, but it, we don't all live by B&H, right? And that's probably about the only brick and mortar store you can walk into and actually talk to someone who really, really knows what they're talking about and compare yeah. the cameras and they'll spend as much time as they want, as you want with them. Yeah. But that's just not, normal camera store is some spotty teenager who doesn't know anything and he's going, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Even going to trade shows, I find that so frustrating. You go to Photokina, biggest photography show in the world, right? You go up to any one of these manufacturers' booths, and you talk to the people, and most of them go, um, well, you can look that up on the website. <laughs> Why are you here? <laughs> Why did I fly fly all the way over here? Don, Don is, is, say one of these stores popped up in your neighborhood. You know, would, you, would this be your de facto place to go to, to learn more about the particular camera that you wanted? Well, I, I would certainly check the place out, and if they were, I don't know if they're going to do this, but if I could get, like, um, really odd parts and things from Canon, like if I need a maintenance cartridge from a large format printer, I could walk in and pick one up, or a focusing screen for a camera, or uh, all assortments of lens hoods in stock, and you can just walk in and get it. Mm -hmm. There's a convenience factor there, and Canon may be able to deliver on that. But I think if you look at the, the problems with the retail space right now as far as camera stores go, uh, people may walk in uh, to get some valuable feedback, and there are still some people in the stores, although the majority of them, like you said, Joseph, don't really know what they're talking about. Uh, figure out, pick up the cameras, figure out exactly which one they want, and then go buy it online. Yeah. And you know what, as far as Canon's concerned, that's okay if they pick up the camera in the store and they don't buy it there because Canon's still going to make money on it. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe not as much. Way. What's that? I think that's the only way because I think for this store, it was reading the article, it was saying that, that you will still buy from the local resellers. Exactly. They're not there exactly. to sell it to you. They're just there to show it to you. So and it's a show I and think tell that that's about, yeah, it's the only business model that I think could necessarily work. Um, now, I would still like to have a, a retail location where I could get more than just the experience. I could buy accessories. I could get the hard to find stuff. Um, and I, if, if they don't do that, then I don't have any reason to really ever go there. Uh, most of my uh, input and feedback comes from, you know, online, from friends right. that might have a camera or uh, just getting my hands on, on the gear in many other ways. Uh, yeah. Or I just look it up and I know it's exactly what I want. And most people do that too. Yep. So I'm trying to, I'm having a hard time with this. You know, last week we, we talked about Polaroid jumping into the retail space mm -hmm. and doing something very similar. And I just, I don't see this retail space giving too much back to, to the brands. But if you look at Canon and Nikon and Sony and Olympus and a lot of the other companies that are all fighting for attention, uh, like you said, Joseph, the cameras are pretty much neck and neck. Uh, you'll get very comparable features no matter which camera you go and buy. And you can't really walk into uh, a, a retail store today or look online and buy a bad digital SLR. They're all so good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, right. Some are better than others. So I, I could see this as just being one way that Canon has the ability to get somebody 
somebody's attention to have their name stick in their head by having you know a gigantic Canon billboard or a store in a mall and to have some sort of impression that will last all the way through to the time when they make the purchase. Uh, but that's quite a gamble because this venture probably doesn't come by cheaply for that's them. That's what I was so. going to say. This is not not cheap. We're talking what 6,600 square feet, expert staff on oh, it's hand, huge. Yeah. exhibits, interactive discovery tables. I'm just reading down the list here. A photo studio with the latest cameras and flashes, classrooms for seminars and presentations. I mean, I mean <laughs> you could do a lot online for that much money and that much rent every month and salaries and healthcare and all that stuff. But I don't know. Yeah, I'm, on, I'm with you now. I'm on, I'm on the fence about yeah, I would love to walk into a store that's specifically devoted to photography and see all this stuff. And it reminds me of uh, when I was when I was stationed in Japan. We used to go into the store called Yodobashi Camera, and it was just like you'd walk in there and angels would sing, and you know, <laughs> everything was oversaturated and beautiful and bright. You know, <laughs> and I I miss that kind of feeling. I mean, you can go online and shop all day long and buy it now. You know, but Amazon you, you get Prime that things. Feeling. Exactly, but you I get want that, that feeling. I want um, that feeling, but at, at the same time, I look at it from my adult head, and I'm like, okay, overhead involved with this. The fo a lot of the photo retailers are shutting things down, and Kodak, yeah, Pint all this stuff is going on. Yet Canon is going to push forward on a on a retail distribution hub kind of thing. I don't know. Well, I was going to say you get the feeling from B and H. Uh, you know, when you yeah. can walk in, and they've got you know uh, 500 different tripod heads for you to yeah. examine and yep. get your hands on from every different manufacturer and every camera that's currently made and and every lens that's currently made, and you can you can see everything from every bit of competition and make the comparison yourself. And you don't necessarily have that with this Canon initiative. And um, I think that might be the, the big deciding factor. They won't get a lot of foot traffic because people want to see what else is out there. Yeah. And uh, it's they don't have the... Uh, the the market appeal that Apple would when people already know they're buying an Apple product they just got to figure out exactly which one right they just want to go that, touch it and make the final decision yeah right? the brand loyalty I don't think is there with uh, with cameras these days unless you've got a, an SLR and you've got some sort of commitment to it uh, but then you pretty much know what you're going to get next anyhow you don't need to go and see it yeah well Sony Sony also has retail stores as well I've seen they're in local malls around my neighborhood. Yeah, um, and and they're they're dying. I mean, we've had one for uh, here for the longest time. I've never seen anybody in it. Yeah, I walk every time. I've never gone in there. Every time I walk by it, you know what goes in my head? I think memory stick. I'm not going in there. <laughs> 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 memory stick and the A track, you know, music format that was trying to kill MP3. That's what I think about, and I walk away. I don't know, Joseph. What is this the first step that we're going to see? Are we going to see? Maybe a Nikon coming up next with a Nikon series of stores. Well, I'm sure or... everybody's going to be watching this to see how successful it is. Um, certainly, yeah. this isn't going to go unnoticed. I think that if it's just about coming into play with Canons, then you know, y'all could be right. It's not going to go very far. It'll be it'll be quiet after not too long, just like a Sony store. Mm -hmm. But they do talk about having the classrooms and the photo studio in there, right? So if you've if you turn it into this social environment, photographers like to hang out with other photographers and talk, whether it's online or in person. Yeah. It's great, whether it's a workshop or just an evening seminar or just, you know what, I'm going to, I got an hour to kill. I'm going to go down and grab a coffee, you know, set up a coffee shop inside, a little cafe. People sit around and talk about photography. And you got all the photography magazines there to pick from and photography books. And mm -hmm. people can just, you know, shoot the stuff about photo. Yeah. That could be kind of cool. It makes it a bit more social. That could be quite interesting. Uh, we'll see what they do with it. If it's that's a lot of money for Canon. social, though. I mean, that's yeah, a it's money. a lot of money to, in order to to. I'm just trying to figure out what it adds to their brand if they're not actually right. selling anything there as well. And yeah. uh, I, I'm with you, Joseph. There's value, but I just don't know if it's the right way to go about it. Um, yeah, you know, like, I'd love to go. I don't a, know if I'd want to pay for it though. They'd be better off putting yeah. a display in Starbucks or something. <laughs> you know, and say, like, "Hey, here's some Canon cameras." I don't know. I don't know. But the other cool thing I was reading here that um, they they partnered with 500pics.com to have local galleries inside the store. So that's kind of cool to bring sort of the the virtual world in and you know the curated images from 500 pics can't be bad at all. So sure. <laughs> Yeah. Right. So and and 500 Pix is, is a Canadian company as well. And uh, and this uh, this first store, this first Canon Experience Center is uh, is opening up in uh, in Canada in Calgary. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, there's a bit of a connection there. They're probably going to be working together, but I just don't know how much uh, effort. Like, if they have 20 stores, then is do they have somebody at, at 500 PX working on curating 20 separate galleries and f making sure that the photographer is local to wherever that particular store is? It just seems like it it could logistically fall apart. It's a great idea to start with, but you know, give it three months, and and I hope it's still going. Yeah. Well, you you say that. I think I would say. I don't think it's a great idea to start with, <laughs> but give it three months and we'll see if it's still going. Yeah. <laughs> so, we'll check back in. We'll be around. They may not be, but we will. Um, all right. So this next story that I want to chat about, guys, is this. I just saw this today and I retweeted it because I saw or I reposted it on Google Plus because uh, I saw Scott Kilby had men was mentioned. In it. in fact, it was a Scott Kilby post that I reposted and it's from Google. So Google listed, let's, let's read this so I don't mess it up. Um, it's Google's list of the photographers who generate the most results in online searching, right? So, and there's a bunch of names on there that I don't know and a bunch that I do know, but reading this list, there's some omissions on here. And I wanted to throw it to you guys. Don, I want to throw it to you first. So looking at this, looking at this list, are the 16 people that are at the top, are they surprising to you or how do you feel about it? Uh, some of them are. As some of them are names that I recognize and I respect and, and they mm -hmm. should definitely be there. But there's a lot of names on there, especially high ranking names that I didn't necessarily even recognize. Yeah. Maybe it's just my field of photography or uh, you know, my, my area that I pursue, these names don't come up very often. And then I started to think, well, this is a list of seven or sixteen uh, photographers on here, and uh, that's sort of an odd number to uh, to start with, anyhow. And uh, I was looking at at the, at the rankings and th thinking to myself, well, these numbers seem a little bit out of whack. Like I think that the number one person on there is David Bailey, and I tried to type in his name in quotes, and it didn't come up nearly to the fifty million that that they associated. Mm -hmm. And then I took a look at the, the bottom of this list, and I was just trying to pick it apart and, and have mm -hmm. some fun with it. And I think that the bottom name on the list was um, uh, Lara Jade, and I typed that in without quotes in it, and it came up to the number that they that they that they displayed, I think, at 2.1 million or something mm. like that. Yeah. And that means that uh, any Laura or any Jade, spelled in the same ways, uh, would have come up as, it doesn't have to be that person, right? So 2.1 oh. million results, unless you put the quotes around it. When you do that, Frederick, I found this out, and I thought it was kind of fun, that um, if you put your name in quotes, mm. you beat some of these people. You should be on that list, Frederick. Mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not worthy. <laughs> what I'm you finding know, funny but, that you're saying that I had to try this out. I typed my own name in without quotes and then with quotes and with quotes, it's four times as much as it is without. With quotes? Yes. It's <laughs> just completely backwards. That's oh, weird. that's Google for you. I have no idea how. Yeah. Uh, yeah see, that's a, but the, time, but the whole thing to wrap the, to sort of put a bow on this thing, this is, like you're saying, Don, this is results. If I have more results than some people on that list, I would say everybody on that list is a better photographer than I am, right? So I would, I would look at that list and think, okay, are they doing this math specifically by numbers or is there a way that they could cut it so that activity online is factored in or your popularity of your images or something? Because numbers don't really mean anything. You could put a bot out there and generate a million pages with your name in it tomorrow, right? Exactly. So, uh, and if you've got like a, a huge number of uh, followers on Twitter or Google Plus or anything like that, that won't be reflected within these results. Uh, so your reach is really not calculated properly by any given metric. You'd have to combine things together and depending on how you do that, it's always going to favor one person or another. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily reflect, uh, reflect the quality of work that they do. So I, I look at this list and, and I see that these are great photographers, mm -hmm. but I don't know if they are the currently going best photographers uh, that are out there on the internet right now, uh, interacting and, and showing off their work and creating some masterpieces. Yeah, so, so Joseph, looking at this you're looking at the title to the story, Google's top 16 most popular photographers online. So how could they reword that to make it accurate? Well, I, mean, I think that, <laughs> I was well, no, for I, a softer well, word. No, but I think that wording is very well chosen to be accurate because it is most popular popularity based off of number of links pointing to them. That's basically what that is. It's not mm. best photographers. It's not most qualified. It's not most interesting. It's simply most popular based off of Google ranking. Maybe they, if they switch it around, they say the top 16 most popular photographers on Google. 
right? Because yeah, it could be interesting to run the test on Bing or or Yahoo or one of these other exactly. engines. And see exactly. What happens too. Because there's it's a big yeah. world out there. You know, Google is is a nine hundred pound gorilla, but there are other gorillas out there. <laughs> <laughs> and well, what's interesting too is I find that some of the photographers on this list, you know, it just take Ansel Adams for example. Uh, he never had any social presence on the internet by his own virtue. I mean, uh, he was well before that era of technology, but he's being talked about quite a bit. So mm -hmm. you can say that because he's not actively pursuing uh, all of this traffic to his name, that he may be, uh, you know, just by... But by, by, by the fact that he's uh, he's passed on and, and all of his work sort of survives past uh, past that and well onto the internet, that he's doing far better than a lot of the other people on that sure. list. Uh, and depending on how long you've been a photographer, would also affect uh, where you show up online too. So it's uh, it's kind of some some fuzzy logic in there, but uh, it, it's a good list, and everybody should go check it out. And you'll if you don't recognize any any names on there, dig deeper into them. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's some great photographic works that I hadn't seen that I was exposed mm -hmm. to today when I looked up the story. So it's it's yeah. worth checking out. Yeah, all said and done, it's a it's a good place to start a discovery, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Don, your your main point though about the quotes is really the key, and I think that the original writer of this list um, needs to be slapped for that because that is it makes a huge huge difference. Yeah. It certainly does. And I guess especially because I think David Bailey coming up number one, that's a very common first name and a very common last name. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you get somebody that, uh, that if you put quotes on that, that number gets cut by, by a huge margin. So mm -hmm. uh, slap on the wrist, but go check it out. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Check it out with a grain of salt. <laughs> awesome. Good stuff, guys. Um, okay. Story number three is we just wanted to do a quick social media update. But before we do that, I want to talk about the, uh, the Facebook graph search have you guys have you seen the news on that i looked it up it looked interesting um yeah. although some of the the information that they were throwing out there uh in the article that uh that, that we've linked to here in our show notes um it, it says you know it, you could type in anything that you want you could say show photographs of my friends uh before 1990 and you get to see them when they're uh when they're younger and when they're kids and all that mm -hmm. um but I'm trying to figure out how they categorize that because if I were to take a photograph of myself, you know, as, as an infant and post that on, uh, on Facebook, I don't have any exit data associated with that photograph. There's no date in which it was taken unless I specify that, that information might be missing and missing from Facebook's uh, search algorithm. Right. So it's, it's interesting to try and figure out, well, maybe they can recognize it if it's well, a picture of me. You, you would specify it. But I, I'm tr I was trying to figure out if I didn't, could they figure it out? So, like, let's say if, if I was tagged as being that person and Facebook could detect that it was an infant and Facebook knows the date that, uh, the, the day that I was born, then Facebook might be able oh. to put those pieces still together because they've got a lot of information about you. That and they might really be able scary. to figure out roughly how old you were in the picture, roughly what year it was taken. And so it was kind of scary when I got down thinking about <laughs> and then it, Facebook, how much information they actually have. Then Facebook would need to send back an Android into the past to kill the future, the you, so that you... <laughs> <laughs> Skynet, it gets I'm afraid. I'm afraid. <laughs> and you can't even delete your Facebook account. Yeah, exactly. Scary. God, God. Joseph, have you, have you seen this? Did you, did you see I did. The, the article? Yeah, I watched their, uh, their demo video. Uh, did you get all excited and like, oh, I got to go jump on Facebook now? All really... I did. I did. I went and I tried to search, and then I said, "Oh, beta thing, not really active." Dang. Yeah. Um, it looks really cool. I, I, you know, look, our our whole existence is online these days. Everything we do is online, and trying to protect your privacy is almost a, you know, it's almost a moot point at this point. You know, who are you protecting it from? Um, I'm not putting my credit card numbers on Facebook, but the pictures of me and where I like to eat. Yeah, all that stuff is interesting to your circle of friends, and to be able to search like that, I think it's kind of cool. Yeah. I do. So you're you're the anti curmudgeon here, huh? Yeah, man, I'm I'm gonna go for it. I signed. I click the let me know when I can play button, and we'll see what happens. I'd I'd love to give it a go. It's interesting because you can put in natural language. I love the how everything is, things are going natural language now. Yeah. So you can type in, you know, how many of my friends or show me my friends based in the Oregon area that are above this age or within this age range that like Sex in the City. You know, that kind of thing. Right. And then get a list of those people and then narrow it down because then it'll display a bar to allow you to narrow that down even further. So that's interesting. That's interesting. I just not I'm not quite sold on how it relates to this week in photo, but it's it's still interesting. 
And it, it's scary to think, too, that if they've got this technology that they're rolling out to every user of uh, Facebook because of their, uh, their vast information that they have on all of us, imagine what tools they have behind the scenes for advertisers that could mm. potentially want to exploit all of that information as well. So, yes. Um, it gets well, a little it's scary. kind of the reverse. It's kind of the reverse of the advertising technology that they have because they could all, already drill down to, you know, show me all the females in this zip code that have said they like this particular thing in this window of time with four or more female friends. You know, you could you could do that kind of targeting with Facebook ads today. So it sounds like they're just they're flipping it and putting a more consumer UI on it. I don't know. I'm Interesting times. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm getting old. See, I'm becoming a curmudgeon. See, in my mm -hmm. day, we had libraries, and we liked it. <laughs> like it. It's all over. It's all over. It's downhill from here. All right, guys, I'm going to do a quick mention of our sponsor, our wonderful sponsor, Joseph. Thank you for talking about him at the beginning of the show. But uh, the uh, sponsor for this episode of This Week in Photo is Squarespace. This is the blank spot where in post-production... We will add the uh, pre-read advertising. For Are we going to mention Instagram as well? Oh, yeah. Let's bring it back around to Instagram. Perfect. Okay. All right. And that was a quick ad about Squarespace.com. So back to that, that topic that we were talking about, guys. Um, Instagram has put their terms of service in the kiln, so to say, so to speak, right? So they had all that kerfluffle about the, the words that they had in there. People were dropping off the service left and right, knee-jerk reaction, in my opinion. Um, and now they've finally released the full official terms of service and made it real. What does it mean? Don, should we be afraid? Should we run for the hills or what? Well, yes. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if you look at this... It, it's, <laughs> You take a look at the numbers, and and they're um, they're yeah, using yeah, yeah, constantly world. going down, but their their language hasn't changed substantially. They did get some of the scary language out of there, but they're still allowing people to come in and uh, and like third party licensing and all of that stuff that's outside of your control. Yeah. And maybe they need it, maybe they don't, but it's not spelled out in a way that would make me feel comfortable. Like you it mean, doesn't in, like, in English. You mean? It, well, yes, uh, yeah. but it, more than that, in, in a way that shows very clear limitations in the language mm -hmm. and spells out exactly what the uses could possibly be for. And you know what? If they want to change those uses down the road, then revise your terms of service. But spell it out and don't leave things vague and open to interpretation. Yeah. Uh, the more solid that is, the more comf comfortable I feel uh, using a service like Instagram. Uh, so I'm still not completely comfortable. It, it, it's better, but I, I don't post anything on Instagram and even if I did it wouldn't be anything that I put a lot of effort into creating it would be just cell phone snapshots and putting a filter on it and having some fun with it and I sure. really wouldn't care too much what Instagram does with that if anything at all if they wanted to so I wouldn't personally be afraid because I wouldn't be putting anything of my you know my masterpieces or any of my favorite um, images up there so yeah. yeah, do what they want with what people put on there, but just know that anything you put anywhere on the internet could end up somewhere without your knowledge and most likely will, uh, whether it's legal for people to do so or not, your stuff's going to end up different places. If you put it online. Joseph, yeah. I know you're an avid Instagram user. What, yeah, you, and we haven't talked since this, the whole thing went down. So where did you stand then? Where do you stand now? Um, at okay. that moment when everybody was panicking, I will admit that I looked at an alternative. I looked at the new Flickr because right about the same time Flickr released their new version of the app and I played with it. And um, You know, it's all fine, but I, I, I didn't jump ship and I'm glad that I didn't because they obviously they came out later and said, oh, that's not what we meant and people are just panicking. You know, like you said, Don, at the end of the day, your stuff's going to be online and one way or another people are going to get their hands on it and if they want to do something with it, they shouldn't, they're going to do it. So I don't put... You know, my best work on there either. It's all pretty much all iPhone pictures. Sometimes I'll send a, a, a better camera photo over to it to share. But yeah. at the end of the day, it's just it's just for fun and a little bit of marketing and self promotion and that sort of thing. And that's what it is. I'm I'm just not going to worry about it that much. Yeah. I'm more concerned about once it gets onto Facebook. Obviously, Instagram is owned by Facebook, but their terms are different. So I'm a little bit more concerned about it once it gets on Facebook. But you know what? I like having a picture on Facebook that people can comment on, not a link people have to click on and then don't comment on or don't even click on the link. Mm. So 
like you said, it's not your best work. I'm not going to worry about it too much. Yeah, someone wrote an article that I that I liked. It was I forget who it was, and I apologize to you if you were watching this, but it was basically it was the gist of drawing the picture that nothing is free, and that these free services that you sign up for and enjoy, and then start complaining when they do things that you don't like. You're paying for it with your attention and your account, and you're you're part of their revenue model. <laughs> so you know, and then we we complain like it's like we're staying we're staying in a friend's guest room, and then complaining because he didn't paint the room the right color. You know, it's it's kind of <laughs> kind of weird. I don't know. All right. Uh, earlier this week, I had a chance to sit down with Ian Stone. He's the director of marketing over at uh, Zenfolio. We had a nice conversation about their recent acquisition by art.com. Ian's a character. So if you're listening to this on audio, be sure to head over to the website, the thisweekinphoto.com website, and watch the interview as well. But he has some pretty interesting things to say in this audio piece, too. So give it a listen. All right. You can learn more about Ian by visiting his website over at ianstone.zinfolio.com. That's his personal Zenfolio site, or of course, if you learn about Zenfolio, just head over to art.com. No, I'm kidding. Zenfolio. <laughs> <laughs> head over to Zenfolio.com. All right, guys, this is my favorite time of the show. It's time for some listener Q&A. This, uh, this is where you guys get to answer questions that have come in from the audience. It's been at the top of things that have been on the top of their minds. The first question is from Andrew McDonald, and he says, let me read this. He says, I'm trying to touch up an old panoramic photo, and I'm wondering if there are any resources on the web about the best process or some tips or techniques you could recommend to make it look great. I don't have any. I don't have the negatives. Only a faded print. I've done a bit of research and have not found what I was looking for. Joseph, what should <laughs> Andrew McDonald do to take this messed up faded print with no negative from zero to hero? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw in a plug here for the training company that I do a lot of stuff for, Video to Brain. I just yeah. typed in retouching into their search box to see. 16 different courses came up that mention retouching. Now, I don't know, um, I should have looked up this up before. I don't know that any of these is really dedicated to retouching. But here's one with uh, a Wake Up Masterclass on photo imaging and editing and things like that. And I think that basically, you know, you probably can find, I would imagine, a video that is dedicated to that. But at the end of the day, it's one of those things where no one can show you how to fix this crack, how to fix this particular blemish, you need to learn the techniques so that you can then take those techniques and apply them to this job. Yeah. You know, it's like that nobody teaches you how to make a right turn from First Street onto Main Street. They teach you how to make a right turn. You've got to figure out how to watch for the pedestrians and everything else. Nice. So you just got to, you know, you take the basic knowledge and put it together. Uh, there's so much online learning, both free and paid, that you can find on retouching, basic retouching to super advanced retouching. I really, uh, I, I think that that's just the way to go. Is just learn the basics and then apply the knowledge. Totally, and I and for for this for Andrew McDonald, I would suggest searching for restoration as well. So retouching and restoration. That sounds like what you're looking for. Retouching is going to be more leaning towards um, beautification of models and that sort of thing, whereas restoration is when you recreate a photo that's been damaged, like the one it sounds like that you have. Don, what about you? Any any thoughts on how to get your brain around the restoration slash retouching space? Well, the restoration thing is a little bit interesting because um, if you've got like an old panorama and it's a true panorama where you've got like two different negatives that have been combined together to create a print. Um, I've got a couple of these kicking around here uh, that my dad and my grandpa did in years past and they're never aligned quite properly. Yeah. Uh, so you might have this same issue with the, the, the print that you've got and, and you can do all the retouching stuff and everything uh, to help fix that alignment issue as well. Or you can uh, uh, like split it back up into its two separate parts and then automatically just readjust the horizons if they're slightly uh, crooked by uh, maneuvering and then reblending everything back together. So there's all sorts of Photoshop stuff. And like uh, you and Joseph said, th th there are tutorials online that will cover uh, restoration and that will cover retouching. And all of these things, you just have to sit through a bunch of it and you might spend an hour and you get five minutes of useful information that applies just to this specific thing. You've just got to go out there and find it. Uh, there may be a very specific tutorial just on this, uh, but if, if you're having trouble finding it, then it's probably because you've got to sift through the, the whole bulk of knowledge, and you'll be better off because of it. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Joseph, you got something up on the screen. I do. I threw something on screen. You said restoration, so I put that keyword into Video to Brain, and there is a title titled Photo Restoration in Photoshop, Bring Old Photos Back to Life. So there you go, $34.99 from Video to Brain. Just go to videotobrain.com, type in restoration to the keyword, and that is exactly what you are looking for, Andrew. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Two hours and it's three hours long. Uh, yeah, t- yep, yeah, there you go. Oh, by Tim long. Gray, too. Tim's yeah, awesome. Yeah, and Tim's yeah. great. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. So. All right. Well, thanks for finding that, Joseph. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's uh, that's good stuff. I love, you know, I, I say it all the time on the show, but just the all this stuff that you can do now when you get, get a wild hair in your head about some different photographic technique that you want to try to get your brain around, you could just sit at home or somewhere else on a device and learn about it. I love that. I'm this, it just... Yeah. I get tickled every time I think about that. It's pretty awesome. All right, question number two. Ron Heyman says, can you recommend a compact point-and-shoot camera with settings for techniques such as varying depth of field, backlight compensation, um, black and white mode, touchscreen menu, et cetera? This would serve as my backup camera, and my price range is under $275. Hmm. Does such a thing exist, Don Komarichka? You know, I did some research earlier, and I was trying to think of what what great pocket point-and-shoots would have all these features, and all of them came up pretty much above his price point. Mm -hmm. You know, even looking at something like the uh, the Canon S90, if you can get one of those, that's going to still hit over $400. And uh, that might be outside of your price range to get all of those features. Uh, yeah. If you're looking for a point-and-shoot, you're also not going to find any uh, point-and-shoot cameras that will give you an appreciable control over depth of field because the sensor inside the camera is just too small. Yeah. So even if you've got the money to spend on one of these, it might not hit all of your uh, feature specs. I'm going to say if, if you're looking for something, look possibly invest a little bit more, get something a little bit bigger, save up, uh, you know, put some more pennies in the piggy bank and... Uh, Whatever camera manufacturer, I don't think they, that he says uh, what his regular camera gear is. No, but he didn't say if, uh, if you're Canon, you know, take a look at the EOS M as a backup, and you can maybe use your existing lenses. Or uh, if, like, I, I've got a, and, and very few people uh, are this way, but I've got a friend of mine that shoots with um, an Olympus E5, mm-hmm. and they're looking at getting one of the micro four thirds cameras because they can use all of their regular four thirds lenses on the smaller body. And uh, if you're looking at a backup system, but you still want all the versatility of your main gear and the backup is because if your main camera body dies, you want a replacement, look at something that'll still take those lenses and put a bit more cash into it. Yeah. Joseph, would, would it make sense for, for Ron Heyman to maybe think used? Well, that's something? exactly what I was going to say is if he really is looking for a backup camera, but that's his price range, then yeah, go used. Um, I don't think he doesn't say, yeah, he doesn't say what his camera system is, but let's just say it's Canon. I'm sure you can pick up a Canon 20D for a couple hundred within that price range. And that's not an amazing camera by today's standards, but you know what? That was my first Canon DSLR, mm-hmm. and it's not bad. You know, it's a pretty decent little camera. Yeah. And if you can get a used body for really cheap, then that's a great way to go. If he wants the compact camera because he wants the compact pocket camera, uh, for that price range, you know, like you said, there's not a whole lot of control, uh, not a whole lot of options out there at that cost. But if it's about control and adjustments and black and white mode and things like that, um, you know, get an iPhone with a ton of apps on it. So there's that option. And there's this other option that uh, it's not anywhere in the notes here, but I wanted to bring up this new Canon PowerShot N that they advertise or mm-hmm. launched at CES. You guys seen that? Mm-hmm. This whole social mm-hmm. sharing filters built into it. It's got all kinds of cool controls over it. That's going to be under $300 according to, uh, according to the news on that. So yeah. that's at the top of its price range there, but you know, again, it's not a pro camera, but it's going to have the touch screen. It's going to have the black and white modes, black and white comp- or backlight compensation. That's just being able to over and under expose the shot, so you can do that with anything. Yeah. Pretty much the only thing you may miss is true depth of field, and it doesn't have a, a whole lot of aperture control. But yeah, that's just ain't going to happen at a cheap camera. So until the physics of light change, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm working yeah. on that. <laughs> yeah. So, so on this slight tangent on this, I'm just curious from the both of you. One site that I haven't been on in a long, long time is eBay, you know, and I, I haven't purchased anything off eBay. I haven't sold anything on eBay. I got things that I need to, on, but I haven't. Um, I've used Gazelle, but I haven't used eBay. Have you, have you guys been using eBay at all? I bought a couple of cheap little things on eBay. Um, I bought a set of close-up filters uh, just as a classroom demonstration tool, and, and they were pretty good as far as what they are. I got a set of four or five of them for 20 bucks, mm-hmm. and if you go to the, the, you know, the retail stores or whatever, you pay a heck of a lot more. So there is still some bargains that can be found. Um, 
I'm always a little bit weary about buying a used camera if I can't get it in my hands to begin with because you never know uh, how the descriptions might differ from uh, what you actually receive. You don't want one uh, that was surfing with somebody, right? <laughs> it, well, exactly, exactly. Yeah, you, yeah. The, the, lens comes, uh, the lens comes in and out, but the, the screen in the back is all full of water. So, right, right. Um, it, it's, it's interesting when, when you mention eBay, Frederick, and I think that it's something that he could look at, but buyer beware. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think I think what scared me away from eBay, I may go back, was last time I put something up for sale there was I got I got just inundated with these Nigerian scammer things and yeah, all this um, stuff. And I was just like, you know what? I'll keep it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need that money that much. I'll just keep it and look at it. You know, it becomes an artifact. Joseph, have you had that experience at all? Uh, no, not with the scammers. Um, I haven't used eBay much, but I actually did just use it to sell off a couple things. Sold, I got an iPhone 5, and I sold my old iPhone 4, not even the 4S, the 4. Nice. How'd that go I for you? It went great. I sold it for more than what I paid for my iPhone 5. Nice. Yeah, so, you know, that's not too shabby. It's unlocked, right. of course, because it's out of contract, so that worked out pretty well. I got to um, get back into it. And I have bought a few things. You know, you were talking about the cheap camera stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of really good deals. It's kind of like going into the back streets of Hong Kong looking for cheap camera accessories because that's where a lot of that stuff is coming from. And it may take a couple weeks to get to you, but if you're not in a super rush, you don't need that Amazon overnight shipping, um, you can definitely find some good deals and... You know, just that's the nice thing about eBay with all the ratings on there. You can rate the sellers, and you'll see right away if someone's got a crap rating. But if they've got a really high rating and five hundred thousand people have rated on them, well, then you know they're probably okay. They're probably okay. Use the crowd, yeah. right? Use the wisdom of the crowd. Yep. yep. All right, guys. Let's move into the picks of the week. Another one of my favorite segments. This is where you guys get to pick anything and recommend it to the TWIP audience, as long as it is somehow related to photography. Joseph, I'll give you the honors first, since you haven't been on in a while. What's your pick oh, of the week? Thank you very much. So um, I'm going to use this for a totally shameless self-promotion here. Um, I used ever, a different I used a different term before we started the show, but we won't go. There. You did, you did, <laughs> and it's not you haven't hijacked my lower third to put that in, so I guess I'm okay. Um, <laughs> uh, so I think, as most of the listeners know, I also run the website ApertureExpert.com, and I have a training from that is sold by Video to Brain for Aperture called Work Like a Pro Photographer in Aperture 3. And that is coming up on probably a year and a half old now. I just released a new update, uh, kind of an add-on, an addendum class to it. It's a Aperture 3.3 slash 3.4 new features workshop because quite a few things changed in 3.3. So this is a lower cost workshop. It's only an hour long. And if you own, if you bought the previous version, you can get a discount on the new one as well. Just head over to Aperture Expert and look for the post on that. But uh, but yeah, there's a, it's a nice little wrap up workshop, and I have other photo related workshops on there as well. I can make creative workshops that you may want to check out. So, so Joseph, uh, Joseph, you mentioned you mentioned yourself being the aperture expert, and I can't let this show go by without asking you where the heck four? is the Fantastic Four? I mean, <laughs> you know what's so funny is uh, so I released this training right. I'm not recorded this I guess late last year, and of course it takes time to edit and put together and get out, and it just was released this week. Um, so I sent out my newsletter to all my, all my folks about it. So why would I release this now? I said, you know what? It's kind of like when you want it to rain, you wash your car. When you want your food to come in the restaurant, get up and go to the bathroom. That's when things happen. So I figure if I release a training, a brand new training video on Aperture 3, 4 is going to come out next week. That's can, I tell, I can I tell you how sad and pathetic that sounds? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Grasping at straws here. Well, yeah, why don't you go do a little aperture dance in the backyard and maybe it'll drop out of the sky. Maybe it will. <laughs> but as you well know, I am a huge supporter of the current version of Aperture and yes. the, the fact that it Do you have a choice? Before. What what's the alternative, Joseph? <laughs> no, no, no. The fact that it wasn't a, a version four, it's you know, for the large part it's just a number. Version three three got a huge amount of features and yeah. all the aperture users got it for free. And that's really what it comes down to. So Okay, so here, the here's aperture could be version three point five, right? Because we aren't there yet. Yeah, and it could be what the four is that everybody wants. But by making it a three point five, it's free for. So what about this? Here's a, here's a different a different take on this. The we we all heard a couple months ago or whatever I forget how long it was ago, but the the management shakeup at Apple, and we know how different things are tied to different things there. Where where does Aperture sit in the okay? It's going to be around for a while longer pipeline at Apple. I mean, like I know I know this is a loaded question because you're the aperture expert and you don't I know you wouldn't say anything to kind of derail it, but honestly, are, 
people that are looking at the Lightroom ecosphere and the Aperture ecosphere and what Adobe's doing and what Apple's doing and where their focuses tend, seem to be at this moment, is Aperture going to be around in six months? Well, yeah. Uh, there, to me, there's absolutely no question of that. And okay. The big reason for that's that, what I want to hear because yeah. we need we need uh, uh, you know every good story needs a protagonist and an antagonist. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the the biggest reason for that, and this is one I've I've hit on over and over again, when when Apple launched both Retina display uh, PowerBooks or uh, PowerBooks, geez, MacBook Pros, yeah. um, the television ads for those, all the advertising featured Aperture. That right, I mean that says it right there. Apple's not going to put uh, yeah. a piece of software that they're about to kill in a multi-million dollar ad campaign. It just doesn't make sense. Mm. So no, it, it's unless it's, they're trying to throw you off the scent. <laughs> right, because that's exactly what they're doing. They're all it's all they're no, dropping that chaff. Guy Joseph, that guy Joseph. We don't want him to get scared and jump ship. So here's what yeah. we'll do: we'll spend a couple million dollars. Yeah, I hope not. They've I mean, I, I really wanted to stay around. I don't know, Don. What do you think? You're you're an, you're a Photoshop Lightroom on the PC user. Yes, yeah, so I don't have a choice. I couldn't right. use Aperture even if I wanted to. Well, you and, could. You, you just know, have to buy a Mac. I mean, come on. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> uh, although it would be interesting if I could have, like, I've got an iPad. It would be great to have a version of Aperture mm -hmm. with a lot of the features on the iPad. I'd use it, mm -hmm. yeah. or at least I try to. Use it. Have you tried iPhoto on the iPad? I have, and it is very powerful, but it, uh, yeah. it, it doesn't have the, the level of uh, functionality that would uh, allow me to work well on the road. Uh, I, I use Photoshop, uh, uh, Photoshop Touch, I guess, to do some basic editing and Snapseed mm -hmm. and other things. And yeah. uh, awesome. Aperture, uh, it, or iPhoto rather, wouldn't fit into that, that same workflow. Um, gotcha. But uh, who knows? If, if a Aperture 4 comes out, and it blows uh, Lightroom 4 out of the water, and it does so many things that I can't do, then you know what? I would seriously look at, at getting a Mac to do some editing on if, yeah. if I had no other choice, and it, it really made a big difference. However, I don't see them getting that much of a lead, even if they come out with a new version, sure. uh, because the two are going to be neck and neck uh, for the foreseeable future, I think. That's always the way it's going to be. I think that where Apple has the leg up is things like the iPad um, and all their other components, and if, like you said, if there's an aperture on the iPad, I know a lot of us would love to see something like that. Not because we want that. all the same functionality, but if I could import and do ratings and metadata editing and some basic edits to the photo and then synchronize that back to my aperture library when I get home, man, now that's, that's sweet. That would be yeah, great. But then, the, then, the, then the storage capacity issue becomes sure. the big thing, right? And, unless you well, have sure, some sort of external know, storage for it. But. Yeah, but it's, it's always getting cheaper. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, iPad four is out now. With you can get sixty four gigs. How long is it going to be before we have one hundred twenty eight gig iPads? And right. you know, it's just that's just time. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that it's a very viable. Um, it's a very likely possibility. I think it'll happen. I think we'll see something. Hopefully, at the same time as whatever comes out, Aperture four, Aperture X, or. The new aperture. I like to say that you know, it's all the new. Well, it, it would be wonderful. And I was trying to figure out a use case for this. And if I were to use the camera connection kit to download files, raw files from my camera to the iPad, have the iPad automatically load them up to my home computer in Aperture uh, at home, mm -hmm. and allow me to do some basic edits, do some tagging and everything, so that when I get home and I connect in the rest of everything else that I didn't. Uh, that I didn't download to the iPad, then all of the stuff that I already five starred, that I already want to look at immediately when I sit down, it's already there and ready to go. Sure. So there are use cases for this, and uh, who knows when that'll happen? If they're looking for a point of differentiation, they've got one. Uh, but if we'll ever see it, is, is the question. Yeah. Well, you've got that archive, kind of archive thing with PhotoStream, except that it's not sending the raw file, right? right? It's not, and it's sending a smaller version of the file but it is uploading your photos, the ones that you select to move into your main photo album that go to PhotoStream, it is uploading those to the cloud and then conversely back to your computer if it's running, if Aperture is actually launched and running, it will pull it back into Aperture. So then you've got that backup um, you know, as you go. So that part of it is kind of half there right now. Right. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is Aperture, you heard it here, is not going away anytime soon. <laughs> and we will refer to TWIP 290 in the future, Joseph, Thanks. if something does happen. <laughs> As you should. As you should. As we should. All right. Uh, Don Komoreska, what's your pick of the week? 
Well, bringing it back to what we were talking about, finding cheap stuff on eBay and all that, you could probably find one of these on eBay, uh, or you can find them on Amazon for about seven bucks or so. Uh, this is a little tool that I use in some of my macro photography. It's got a little stand, and it has two little alligator clips and a magnifying glass. It's called a third hand or helping hands or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very helpful to position macro subjects. Like I could hold a flower petal in one of these clips. I could hold another one in this clip and I can dangle the water droplet off of one of them and have it refract. And like it's very easy to reposition things on a very small scale. And they cost less than 10 bucks for one of these things. Hmm. Um, so I'd recommend anybody that wants to play around with that type of photography. This is a very helpful thing to have on your desk. I love that. Where'd you get that one from? Is it Amazon or just? Uh, local I got that one store? off of Think Geek. Uh, however, oh. at the time of this recording, they are out of stock, but you can find a ton of them on Amazon. Think Geek is where you get it. Okay. Yep. <laughs> okay. Cool. All right. I don't even Let's shoot that out. much macro, and I think I might get one because that might that just seems so handy. It, it is looks cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, real quick, my pick of the week is a new toy that I got right here. Let me position my camera so I can see it. Can you guys see this? Oh, what is that? Let me rotate it. And for the people that are listening to this, I'm holding up an ominous looking kind of smallish black box. Looks and like it has two microphones pointing in different directions. It's got two uh, omnidirectional microphones that swivel around. And then on the back, there is a dock connector right yeah. there. Looks like an so, iPhone dock. So what this thing, and on the bottom, there's a tripod socket. And on the side, there's a tripod socket. And audio inputs on the bottom and headphones on the bottom and USB for charging. So what this thing does is basically give you audio for doing interviews and that sort of thing with your iPhone. So you snap your iPhone in there kind of like that and I have a recording device that I can do interviews. I can point a mic back at my face like this and one forward towards the interviewee or I can put a lavalier mic into the bottom and mic my subject and record directly into the iPhone with because that's that's the biggest thing for me is the the audio quality doing videos with your iPhone always sucks because the on camera mic but you solve that with one of these things it's called a Fostech and I put the note in here it's a Fostech uh, AR4i it's about eighty nine bucks and it's on Amazon and it uh, it kind of changed the way that I do a lot of the stuff because it's it's really cool and handy you just throw it in your bag and it's good to go. Do they have one that works with the iPhone five connector? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I have an iPhone 4, so 4S, so I don't <laughs> and AT&T says I can't get a new one until July, so oh, yeah, 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 so I'm stuck, but yeah, so it works so far, and the, that's a good question, Don, so once the iPhone 5 comes out, TWIP listeners, I will be selling this beautiful set, <laughs> right, for the low, low price, no, but it's, it's cool, it actually works, I used it on an interview yesterday, and I used it, I went up to Yosemite, and I did some stand-up interviews or stand-up sort of man in the field type things with it there and it just it works great it's so easy you just slap it in there put it on a tripod and record and away you go so it's very cool in the effort to be simple on things that we do cool. so that's my pick of the week all right guys we're at the end of another episode of twip joseph linashki where would you like the TWIP Army to go to hang out with you online? The TWIP Army, excuse me, the TWIP Army can find me at Photo Joseph pretty much everywhere. I, uh, that's one of the little things that changed. I, Travel Junkie has been, ex, uh, been retired. Oh. So it's at Photo Joseph everywhere. Photo Joseph on Twitter, Photo Joseph on uh, Facebook, on Instagram. It's everywhere. It took, it took an army, but I was able to finally get Photo Joseph on Twitter. So there we go. Bravo. This Thank is you. this is the new kindler, fluffier Joseph with the beard and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and no more travel junkie. <laughs> Very cool. We're glad you kicked that junkie habit, man. That's no good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and Don Komoreska, where can people go to keep up with you online? Uh, well, I'm most active right now on Google+, Plus, so find me there. Uh, I'm doing the Snowflake a Day project, like I mentioned, and I'll be doing that until mid-March sometime, so you get a new one of those every single day. Uh, for everything else that I do, you can check me out on my website at doncom.ca, D-O-N-K-O-M.ca, and that links to pretty much everywhere that I am on the Internet. Very good. Well, thanks, guys. And listeners, to keep up with everything in the TWIP universe, you can check out thisweekinphoto.com. And please join our community on Google+. Plus. We're still trying to keep up with Don's gigantic, <laughs> insane community over there. So please join. How's that the, going, by the way? Uh, we're, we're growing. We're, we're, I think we're at like sixteen or 1,700 or something like that. I don't know. But it's growing. I think we add about 60 or so a day. Um, but yeah, join our community. We'd love to see you over there. And if you're looking for me, you can find me at Frederick Van. 
dot com. And with that, guys, it is time to take that lens cap off. <laughs> <laughs>